Let the disassembly begin. I'm not gonna lie, that already looks way better. Greetings fellow DIYer and welcome to my video. So now that we have the mill apart and I can actually see what I'm working with, you see the base that I built here. And when I originally built this, it was 3 8 by 12 inch plate on the top, beams on the bottom, and then uh, attaching pieces there on the end. And this is where the original column bolted up that the mill head attached to. And I want to retain this mounting system. When I do a project, especially one as ambitious as this, where there's the potential for it to fail, I don't like to modify stuff in a way that I cannot return it to the last configuration that I know worked. So everything that I'm doing to be able to mount the column on this is being done in such a way so that if this was an epic fail, I could pull it off, put the original column back on and not lose anything, be back to the original fixed column mill that I had before. So the column's gonna mount using these four holes. Now, of course, we have this empty space here where the 3 8 plate isn't lining up. So I grabbed a piece of scrap and it's going to fit just like that and uh, will be welded in place. And that's still not going to hurt my ability to go back to the fixed column mill if I so decide. I also drilled two holes in it that are corresponding same distance here as what we have here, just so that it looks cleaner. From there, the base plate will mount into position. And then we're just gonna use bolts to hold it in place. Those back bolts were a little tight. Uh, they were drilled just ever so slightly smaller than these front ones. And that'll be the mount. And that should be more than sufficient to make a nice, tight connection between the adjustable tower and the base of the mill. So I mistakenly thought that once I got my adjustable tower built, that this project would be a bolt-in. And I don't know why I thought that. Experience has taught me that these things are never a bolt-in and they're always way more complicated than you anticipate. The first issue I ran into was removing the swivel piece off the column. I was hoping that the bearing race was part of this top swivel section, that the shaft went down through and that the bearing cup pressed into that. But sadly, the bearing race presses into the main part of this block. So there's no easy way to use the bearing shaft that originally came with the machine without using this piece. So by eliminating this, I have now eliminated the secondary pulley. And the problem with that is in my original setup, the motor was driving the secondary pulley and then the secondary pulley went to the main shaft. So now I have to come up with a new way to support a shaft. I had several ideas on how to make this work. I thought about finding a way to mount a tapered bearing here on the underside and machining a new shaft that uses that bearing and this bearing and so that I could retain the stock shaft. Ultimately, especially with the cradle covering that section and, and bolting to the bottom of this, anything that I did to try and use this mounting location turned out to be more complicated than I had hoped. The other issue I ran into is the motor mount. Now, originally this right here 
That was, I cut that. That was my motor mount. And you can see the slotted holes. That way I could loosen those bolts and extend the mount to tighten up my belt. Again, the carriage takes up all this space. So I can no longer have that motor mount hanging down the way I did before. But I figured I already have these brackets with nice slotted holes. Why not use those to make my intermediary shaft? The solution is a plate of steel and a couple of pillow blocks. These uh, pillow blocks are rated at almost 6,000 RPMs. So they're gonna be way more than what this is actually going to see on a daily basis. So I will simply weld this plate to these sliding brackets. And now I have a location to mount my shaft and have my pulleys come up to connect. It's a little longer, it'll require a little bit longer belt, but it is a simple solution for the problem I'm facing. So this is just a rough mock-up of the entire setup, the way it will mount to the carriage. There are four holes drilled in the bottom of the carriage that correspond to four mounting holes in the mill head. And so the mill head is bolted down to the carriage by those four mounting holes. Then you have the adjustable sides that will be welded to this pillow block plate. From there, a shaft is gonna come through the pillow blocks and go into these pulleys. Now this bottom larger pulley is going to go to the motor and then the top smaller pulley is going to end up going to this bottom drive pulley right here. And then the motor mount will end up fitting roughly like that. The nice thing about all this is it's gonna balance the machine pretty well because you have the weight of the mill head and now you'll have the weight of the motor sitting off the opposite side. So the mill head assembly is pretty much put together. What's really nice about this system is I can easily change out pulleys right here to change out the ratio. My plan is to run this pulley right here on the top. This is a two and a half inch pulley and it gives me a ratio of 3.75 to one between the motor and the spindle. At 3.75 to one, I should have RPMs between about 100 RPMs and 1500 RPMs. And I should have about eight foot pounds of torque, adequate for most of my projects. If I need to run it at a higher RPM, let's say I'm using a smaller end mill, I can swap out to this pulley right here, which is a three inch pulley, and that kicks up my max RPMs to 1800 RPM. And then if I really needed to go a little bit faster, I could put a three and a half inch pulley here, which would make this one to one, at which point I would have a little over 2000 RPMs at the spindle. This is such a small machine, most of the time I'm not going to be running anywhere near 2,000 RPMs. In fact, most of my milling projects will be between 600 and 1,200 RPMs. So that's why I'll go with this smaller pulley to increase torque, and that will be there for most usage. But it is nice that I do have this option. And all this will be totally accessible simply by dropping the carriage to its lowest point and then I can get in here and change these pulleys. Then in the back, this was the original mount that I had made that bolted to what was originally this as the motor mount. And all I did there was take two pieces of angle iron and slot them. Now, irony is spending an hour, hour and a half using a drill press, a file, and a die grinder to make four very ugly slots in two pieces of angle iron for your mill project. I could have knocked these out really quickly on the mill and they would have looked a lot better. Sadly, the mill is in pieces, so that was not an option and I needed to get the project done. But that gives me adjustment so that I can tighten up this belt. Just like the sliding piece on the pillow block gives me adjustment so that I can tighten up this belt. This is the first mock-up where I have mated the tower 
to the base that I'd already fabricated for the previous build. I have the mill head attached to the carriage. I even have the motor attached to the carriage in the back. The purpose of this test was just to make sure everything fit, everything was lined up, everything was working properly, and to make sure that the raising and lowering feature works. And it does. I have this powered with a treadmill incline motor. That's what I was just using to raise and lower it. On the lead screw on the left, I also have a nut attached there so that I can use a wrench to raise and lower it. This build, this mock-up, as is the case with a lot of DIY projects, resulted in a few issues that I'm gonna have to address. The first one being, when I put all this together, I thought that these caps that I have in the corners would be sufficient to hold everything together and keep everything nice and rigid. It turns out that there is a little bit of movement at the top, that those caps have a little bit of play in them. When I put this together, I put diagonal lattice on the sides to help eliminate any twisting. And that lattice has actually made this column rock solid front to back. Like if I push on the top, there is no movement at all. But currently, because there is no lattice or bracing, there is uh, probably 20 thousandths of play in the top side to side. And obviously that's gonna be a problem for the mill. Uh, my solution is gonna be to put angle iron coming around the front here. It'll serve as a bearing cover so that we're not getting a lot of chips and stuff in these linear rail bearings. And then it'll also give me a front face that I can tie into here at an angle and here at an angle. I'll do that in both the front and the back, top and the bottom. And that should shore this up and make it extremely solid. I'm very happy with the project up to this point. I can drop this mill head, uh, the spindle itself, down within a half inch of the cross slide table and I can take it up a full 17 inches from the cross slide table. If I really needed an extra inch, I can actually remove this cover and I could take it up 18 inches, but there's really no reason I should ever be going that high. Of course, I say that now, but some project somewhere along the line will come up and I'll end up probably having to take the cover off to get that extra inch. So this is a quick and dirty tram technique. Obviously this is not the correct way to tram a mill and I need to use my dial indicator to correctly tram this once the build is completely done. The reason I did this is I wanted to make sure that we were close before I did any more work on this project. You know, if this had been way off, then I could have made adjustments in the build. And then once it's fully put together and fully assembled, I can spend a little time dialing it in. But for just roughing and your basic setup, this is how it came in. I didn't have to make any adjustment on this, these one, two, three blocks. I've rotated them all the way around this uh, piece of steel rod and it's a nice connection all the way around. So I would say we are pretty close to true without having to tram anything. And I am extremely happy with that. That is just the result of the technique where I put it together, measure things, check things, take it apart, adjust, and so on. And that's what's allowed me to maintain this kind of accuracy in this build. I'm done reinforcing this. This is a situation where your original plan can sometimes cloud the project as it goes along. Originally, I was going to drill the ends of the rails and tap them and run a bolt down through the top plate into the rails. Same on the bottom. And that would have provided something that was very structurally sound. But when I got the linear rails, I discovered they were hardened steel and drilling them and tapping them was going to be extremely challenging. So that's why I purchased the aluminum caps 
that tie the rails to this plate. The play that I was getting at the top was probably 20 thousandths, which is totally insufficient for a mill. But the fix is extremely strong. I took three inch angle iron, went both sides, front and back, and then I welded a plate to the angle iron across the top. So it's tied in with the bolts that hold the caps, and then it goes across the top. And that keeps the top from moving. And then on the bottom, I used two pieces of angle iron, the same three inch, across the bottom, and it actually ties into the mount inside underneath. And now I have a machine that is extremely rigid. So basically, going from the lathe to the fixed column mill was a significant improvement. And now going from the fixed column mill to this adjustable column mill has made all the difference in the world. I've made a couple of cuts with it, and it is 10 times the machine that it was before. Way quieter. There's not a lot of chatter as I'm making cuts. I can take much deeper passes. This is more solid and a much better setup than what I had before. I can move it out of the way to do tooling changes. I can move it out of the way to change out the vise. I'm going to live with it this way for a while because I'm sure there's a few things that might need to be changed or adjusted. And then once I am pretty sure that I have it the way I want it, I'll blow the whole thing apart and we will paint all of these a nice black to go with the black that was on the base. I'm going to get rid of the jinky lid. I'm going to mount an electrical box on this side. I'm going to mount a fan up here to help cool the incline motor. Currently, it's good for one minute on and eight minutes off because of heat. And the problem with that is if I have to go from all the way down to all the way up, that's about three minutes of running. So I'm going to put a fan that blows air across this motor. And the way I'll set it up is I'll put two switches in this box. I'll put a master switch that turns the power on to the fan and also turns the power on to the momentary switch. And then the momentary switch can be used to raise and lower. And I can leave it on for a while after I've used it and then just kill the whole thing. Or the whole time I'm working, I can leave it on. It's keeping that nice and cool. And then I can just hit the momentary switch to move it up and down. I also need to put stop switches on the apparatus so that when I get to a certain height, that'll cut the power. And when I drop it down a certain amount, that will cut the power. And then it's pretty much done other than paint and uh, any other modifications that I find that need to be done in the relatively near future. If you like what you've seen, please click like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm going to get rid of the janky lit. Oh, try and damage my DRO.